how many DNFs in one week do you get before you just give up and start binge watching the Twilight series? Well, I've discovered it's three. Hi, BookTube, it's Kim at K Backers Books. This is my bookish week for the week ending August 29th, 2020. So let's start with the DNFs, and I'm going to start with the one from last week, which for me is the most egregious, and it is Paris Trout by Pete Dexter, and this was the very first Barter Hordes Book Club pick um, for 2020. And you can see this is not a very long book. This is the story of the main character is the title character, Paris Trout. It's set in 1950s Georgia, I believe, somewhere in the South. I think it's Georgia. Paris Trout is a business owning white man in this small town, and he has been held up by his community as kind of a, you know, upstanding citizen, fairly wealthy business owner. He's been in the town for, I think, his life. So he's well known, he's, he's fairly respected. He's actually pretty abominable and he uh, he's a blatant racist he uh, he runs a kind of a loan sharking business for the black people in the community out of the back of his store he um, loans money to them very small amounts um, with exorbitant interest rates he has uh, sold a car to a young black man um, for a crazy amount of money that this man will never be able to repay uh, the car is a piece of junk. It it gets crashed into this young black man goes to Paris Trout and says, you have to fix this car, and, and Trout refuses. So the young black man leaves it at his store. Well, Paris wants his money, so he decides to go and um, confront this young man at his home. He goes to the young man's home. He's not there. So Trout threatens his family and proceeds to shoot um, a 14 year old young black girl, I think she's 14, between 12 and 14, shoots her, shoots her mother or the woman who acts as her mother. The young girl eventually dies. That's not a spoiler. It happens fairly early in the book. But this particular writer does not develop the characters deeply enough and well enough to, to justify the events in the story. It, this, this book was published in 1988 and it won the National Book Award. So it's a 32 year old story, 32 year old novel. Um, you know, we had a really fascinating discussion on Voxer for this group and everybody, there was all different camps of people who hated it, loved it. The reason I hated it is because it's not written deeply enough to characterize these people's emotions, to make the reader understand why they chose to do the things that they did. He, he offers very superficial pictures of these characters, even the main one, Paris Trout. There are several scenes of gratuitous racism, gratuitous violence, sexual assault. It was uncalled for in my opinion because it didn't move the story. It was simply dropped in as a plot device. Paris Trout shoots these two black women at the beginning of the story and it becomes a legal story. It becomes a narrative of a trial and legal proceedings. But at that point, the black characters disappear from the narrative. And wh what's the meaning of that? Why does it continue with only the continuation of Paris's story and the white people surrounding him? Um, in my opinion, there's an enormous amount of language that's incredibly misogynistic. The way that the author wrote women, uh, women are discarded, they are not worthy of respect, not worthy of consideration. That's just the way it was in the 50s in the South. It's it's not acceptable. And I actually DNF'd the book shortly before the halfway point. I thought it was poorly written, poorly portrayed black people and women. Doesn't, and even for the time period, it didn't, uh, his, his character development was to me almost non-existent. Uh, there wasn't enough for me to see the motivation into the character's actions. He didn't do that well enough for me, and I was surprised that it was a National Book Award winner. So that was a definite fail for me. I'm looking forward to next month's book, which is Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brewster Place. So really looking forward to September's experience. 
Next, I DNF'd At the Wolf's Table by Rosella Posterino. This is a translated novel. It is translated by, it's translated from the Italian by Leah Genesco. And this is the story of Rosa Sauer in Germany in 1943. Um, her husband is in the war, World War II. She's come to live with her in-laws. And the idea of the story is fascinating. She is a German woman who is recruited among other German women to be collected and bussed to a facility where Hitler is, is, um, is there. And their job is to taste Hitler's food before he does in case it's poisoned. So every single day they have to sit for meals, which are incredibly well, well done, delicious, uh, filled with foods that they normally wouldn't be able to get in their real life during the war. So Rosa is among this group of young women, and in the beginning of the story, they are given books on nutrition and biology so that they'll start to recognize signs of poisoning. And it's, again, it's a great idea. I was really looking forward to reading it, but it's boring. And I don't know if it has to do with the translation, but it's very much, um, she did that. And then she said this, and this happened. And I, I was bored. I think I got to 75 pages and I just, um, it was, it was disappointing because I really wanted to like it, but that wasn't for me. And unfortunately, my other DNF, um, which made me really sad was Jonathan Strange and Mr. Nero. Oh, Freddie, I'm sorry. I was buddy reading this with Freddie from Sluggish Reader and it was, I was enjoying it for a little while and I got to 318 pages I think and this is a really long hardcover book. Um, it's it's the story of these two magicians and it's the the story starts off with Mr. Norell which is I was thinking about this the other day it's weird that the title is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell but the primary character in the story is Mr. Norell. Jonathan Strange does not even make an appearance until the 200 page point approximately so that was really strange for me. This is a novel, fantasy novel about these two magicians. There's um, talk of demons and um, fairies and all kinds of fantastical backstory. This is a novel with footnotes. <laughs> and I was so distracted and irritated by that. So I was talking to Freddie along the way, like, I can't stand the footnotes. And he said, yeah, I actually stopped reading them because if I, if I took a break to read the footnote, it pulled me out of the story almost immediately, and I'm, yes, it did. The way it's written, it's, it almost reads like a Victorian novel, and that's that was her style in writing the book. But to me, it's so disjointed because much of the book was originally written in short story format, and she decided to link them together somehow to create a novel. That didn't work for me because it doesn't, it, it, the pacing is so slow, and the pacing is just off. At the 318 page point, I was just, when is something going to happen? And there were certain characters that I loved and certain storylines that were really interesting and I was looking forward to that, but it was just, it was too slow and too disjointed. The transitions were clunky. Uh, jump forward and backward in time periods, pick up on these characters' stories and, you know, 10 chapters later, pick up on a different group of characters. It was it was clunky and I just was not enjoying it. It's not a horrible book. It wasn't for me and I know people who have loved it. And I think Freddie said he's going to continue at a slower pace, but he, he does, he is enjoying it much more than me. What are the books I finished last week? Okay, we're gonna end on a on a upbeat note. I finished two and they are both um, translated books. The first one is Isabel Allende's The Japanese Lover. And this is translated from the Spanish by Nick Castor and Amanda Hopkinson. Um, this is, this, the book starts in 1939 in Warsaw, Poland, and the Nazis are just beginning to come to power and they are just starting to round up the Jews in different cities. And it starts in Poland with Alma's, Alma Belasco's parents. So she lives with her parents and her older brother in Poland. And her parents are well aware that something horrible is going to happen and they want their their children to be safe. Her older brother enlists in the military, so he leaves the family. 
Alma is seven years old and her parents decide they're going to send her to um, America to live with um, her mother's brother and his family in California, uh, San Francisco. So they put her on a ship at seven years old and she travels alone to her American family. And the story develops from there. They are wealthy. They live in a mansion on the sea. Uh, it's a beautiful location, but Alma has to, has to figure out how to live without her parents and how to accept the fact that she may or may never see them again. It, it tells the story of her from age seven into her 80s. It's kind of a sweeping story, not a, not a long book. And the Japanese lover refers to um, the gardener's son at the family mansion. It is a Japanese gardener who brings his, his young son, I think he's 10 or 11, with him as kind of a gardening apprentice. And Alma and Ichime meet each other and immediately form a very um, tight connection and become best friends. The, the war comes into play. It, it discusses what happens to each of the characters once the war breaks out. Um, it, it, was, it moves on from there. That's all I wanna say because I don't wanna ruin any more of the story. Now for me, this would have been a book I probably would not have enjoyed very much because it's sentimental, it's very expository. She does a lot of telling and she does a lot of um, writing for the reader each character's backstory instead of, instead of creatively showing how these characters are developing. I didn't care. I absolutely love the story. And there is an underlying mystery that type that a secret that kind of is bubbling around the surface around the surface. I can't talk the last few days. It's bubbling around the surface of the story, mostly from the beginning of the book. And I guess that fairly early on in the story, probably about halfway through, but I was okay with that. I guessed it and I was right. But as that storyline develops, I was really happy with how it, it went through the story. There was another secret that I was not prepared for that happens at the end of the book and it ties everything together and it it um, was really satisfying to me as a reader that that's how the story ended. I really love the book. It's not perfect. I gave it a four stars on Goodreads, but I really loved it. I loved the story, really enjoyed reading it. And I'm gonna go on to read many more of, of her books, which I already own. So <laughs> looking forward to that. And the second book that I finished last week is another translated work. It's The Years by Annie Arnaud. Now this one is really interesting because um, this was a contender for the International Booker Prize, I think it last year. And there was some question, is it fiction? Is it memoir? What is it? Is it auto fiction? We're, I'm not sure, but this is a book translated from the French by Alison Strayer. And this is this is a such an interesting book. It to me it reads like autobiographical fiction, more closely to the memoir side of of something. But Erno details the years between 1941 to 2006, and it is a book of memories and cultural and political moments that she has that she has kind of detailed, not really in a journal format, but she she writes her observations and her interpretations of old family moments, family photographs, her birth, her life, how she observes the world. It is set very much for a French reader because there's an enormous amount of French culture and French politics, literature, that I was simply not attuned to. and without having to go to Wikipedia every single page. I, there are certain parts of it that I just did not get the references to, which is fine. Uh, many others I did. Uh, I did learn a lot about the war in Algeria, um, the French and Algerian conflict. So that was really interesting to learn about. But the fascinating part of her book is the way she does this. The, she, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collective memoir. She's writing from a we plural perspective. So she never writes from the individual, from her as an individual. It's very clear at, at many moments throughout the, the story or the book that she is writing about herself and from her perspective. The strongest parts of the book are when she does write from a personal level. 
The weaker parts are when she's talking about political moments, cultural moments in French history. It tends to read like a news report. So she's she's giving the reader many different facts in paragraphs and um, those were not as strong for me. But I really did enjoy the book. Um, uh, again, it's very short, but she covers so many years and so much time in this book. And she, she uses the she pronoun throughout the book, uh, never says I or me. So that was a really fascinating book to read, and I enjoyed that. Very quickly, what am I currently reading? Because I gave up on Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, Freddie and I are buddy reading Close Range by Annie Prue. It's a short story collection. We're reading three short stories a week and discussing that. I, I finished the first three. Continuing to read Paradise by Toni Morrison for the... Um, Tony Mor year of Tony Morris in 2020. I am still reading These Truths by Jill Lepore. And I will be embarking on a buddy read this week with Gemma from Read a Book Gem. If you have not seen her channel, please subscribe. I will link her channel below. She's a wonderful booktuber. We're going to start reading Queenie by Candace Cardi Williams. I think we're going to try to do this in a week. It's, it's hopefully going to be a fairly quick read, and I'm really looking forward to that. And the Critical Chicks and I decided we wanted to have fun between our last month's discussion and our next one. So we picked up Beach Read by Emily Henry. This is a contemporary romance that is a beach read. And I'm really looking forward to this for the fun of it, for the discussion, for the story that I heard that was really good. And I'm going to be starting this one once all of us get our books. So that's it for this week, people. And it was it was an eh, it was an ad eh reading week. I did read two really good books. I think I'm gonna embark on two really good ones again and continue to read short stories by Annie Prue, which I'm really excited about. Thank you so much for watching this whole video. Subscribe below, comment below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.